I'm going to talk about probably the most depressing um, black pill topic that, that I think I've ever uh, dealt with, and that's saying quite a bit. Um, last week, I revisited an old topic, one that I make reference to quite a bit, and that's the oligarchy, how the idea of a republic came into existence in Venice and um, in Florence in North Italy, um, and what that means. In Venice, the, the marriage of the sea ritual, and the way that the Medici controlled both Florence and Rome during the Renaissance, and so much of modernity came directly from there. And Machiavelli wrote at that time, a hundred years later, Hobbes brought the same idea to Britain, and that's where the modern world was born. That's not an accident, because the revolution that began then, the revolution that destroyed the Middle Ages, has reached its, its apogee. It's reached its, its zenith entirely in the... Um, the institution of BlackRock, the world's largest multinational, they call the Investment Management Corporation. We've passed oligarchy and have now reached monopoly. It was just a matter of time. BlackRock finishes the revolution that began in Renaissance Italy and worked its way through it would be the Netherlands, Britain, and then, um, of course, New York City, the, um, the domination of the sea in the Eurasian mentality. Black Rock quite literally rules the planet. That's not rhetoric. That's not theory. This is, you know, a mainstream opinion. Um, State Street, Vanguard, and Black Rock or the so-called Big Three, is asset management, and control, directly or indirectly, uh, almost every central bank and every um, corporation of any size on the planet. BlackRock alone has at least $50 trillion worth of assets under its control in one form or another. And the Big Three, of course, own each other. They own each other's stock which is technically illegal, of course, but there's no regulating corporations that control you know, $100 trillion worth of, worth of investment money. It's far more powerful, of course, than any government or any alliance of governments. And what's left to resist them are a few countries that I've dealt with um, individually and collectively uh, and as of right now are, of course, Iran, Russia, China, Armenia for the moment, North Korea, Burma, um, much of Central Asia, Vietnam, Belarus, Venezuela, and maybe Switzerland and Hungary. And those last two are, are iffy. They're the only nations outside of the control of the asset management um, juggernaut. And, of course, they find this completely intolerable. I've said for a long time to stop talking about Soros because BlackRock alone dwarfs um, Soros and Goldman, and much of their asset base has already been bought up by, um, by the Big Three. But even calling them the Big Three is kind of ridiculous at this point because they all, they're essentially one institution. So now you've gone beyond oligarchy. At this point, there's no question. And American politics simply doesn't have the vocabulary or the understanding. There isn't a theoretical foundation in American life to make sense out of this phenomenon. So it's ignored or denied, not because of the facts of the matter, but because there simply isn't a way to theorize or to comprehend or to conceive of this level of power. Actually, it takes quite a bit of work to do so. Um, the Dodd-Frank Act was signed in 2010, 
after the 2008 meltdown. And it was supposed to be a law regulating, I put that in quotes, the most powerful bankers in the world. But even then, BlackRock uh, exempted itself since they wrote the legislation in the first place. It's not regulated as what they call a systematically important financial institution. It's funny how, how this law says that they're going to audit the Fed. And they actually say they're going to make sure the Federal Reserve Bank Board of Directors represents, and this is a direct quote, the public without discrimination on the basis of race, creed, color, sex, or national origin. That's their big concern with the Fed. Of course, it's a mockery of what an audit is, and it's written by the same banking elite that it was supposed to regulate. The people doing the regulating anyway sit on BlackRock's board, so it's now beyond Kafka. Not to mention the bailouts and all the funds that are mandated by the Dodd-Frank Act are controlled by BlackRock regardless. Every one of the um, of these slush funds and bailouts, not just in the U.S., but elsewhere, are under BlackRock's direct control, and they were hired uh, straight away to administer all of this. These are fairly complicated operations. As I always say when Bernie Sanders talks about regulating the banks, you have to laugh at him. You can't regulate that which does the regulating. There is no law. They are the law. So capital, of course, is far more powerful than any government. Governments are dependent on capital. But BlackRock is more powerful than all the globe's capital institutions taken together, making this revolution beyond any other. There is nothing like this in world history. And BlackRock, of course, is controlled by three Jews, Lawrence Fink, Blake Grossman, and Robert Capito. This is the apogee of the titans of Greek mythology. Now, normally in the financial press, you'll talk about how they'll, they'll make reference to, you know, seven or eight trillion dollars. Well, there's really no way to know at this level how much they control, since no one is in a position to, to force them to, to audit themselves. There's no one who has the power to audit them. They normally control audits, but they decide what an audit is. So BlackRock, you're talking about a minimum of $30 trillion. I, said, I see $50 trillion elsewhere. They have a financial risk monitoring software called Aladdin, which adds another $20 trillion. And of course, their investor clients, as they call them, include most of the world's uh, major corporations, banks, insurance companies, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, central banks, and of course, private foundations. So in terms of what they control, it's roughly between 30 and 50 trillion under various forms of, of management. So of course, BlackRock alone towers over every other sector. And this much consolidated power is just absolutely unprecedented. It is the crowning achievement of liberalism. BlackRock is the law. And the paper and, and the, um, the title of this is the apogee of liberalism. BlackRock achieves total global dominion. This is what liberalism is supposed to be. Starting in the republics of North Italy, this is it. They've reached the apogee of what's possible to control financially and politically. Now, in August of 2019, BlackRock created the Great Reset. I said 2019. This is before the COVID scam hit. And they created this with the Swiss National Bank head, of Philip Hildebrand. And BlackRock called a meeting of the central bankers in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. So the Great Reset actually predates the COVID scam meaning it's very possible that COVID was actually created for this, this very purpose. So they came to the conclusion, of course, as I've said for many years, that central bankers have failed to reverse the depression that they created in 2008. And therefore, BlackRock argued in, in uh, 19 that it was time for them to take over both state 
and financial power directly, not just de facto, but de jure. And what it means is the merger of fiscal policy on the one hand and monetary policy on the other, which means pure monopoly. So legislative power has now come under its control. It used to be an informal um, mechanism of power. Now it's a formal mechanism of power. COVID was the final nail in that, in that coffin. So back then, BlackRock decreed the central bank maintained what's called a standing emergency fiscal facility, which would then be put into motion when these artificially low interest rates, even almost 0%, couldn't control deflation. And deflation occurs when demand falls off, and that's the root of the stimulus packages. In other words, they were planning an event to destroy demand and, and drop the value of, of money. So the facility would be run with what they called an independent expert, which, of course, BlackRock would appoint. And that apparently is a new definition of independent. It's an independent expert when BlackRock uh, controls it and appoints them. And, 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 of course, it'll be a member of their board or someone that they train and control. Now, the phrase here that has been around long before Karl Marx but the term is a 19th century term, and it's, a, it's called monopoly capital. And the concept is almost totally unknown. The way Marx defined the term, the normal modes of what we call surplus use. In other words, um, above and beyond what's necessary for a normal life, the normal modes of that use are consumption and investment. And, of course, uh, necessary but unproductive expenses. In monopoly capitalism, those modes of surplus utilization no longer, uh, they're not good enough because production always outruns effective demand, especially in a COVID situation, which leads to a crash in prices and deflation. And this is what COVID did. This is what COVID pushed over the cliff. You now, nationalism... Um, in the 19th century, also developed the concept of monopoly and what it meant for um, you know, Adam Mueller and people like this, even the um, certain elements of national socialism in the, in the 30s created the idea, also uh, contributed to the idea of monopoly capital. The issue, of course, is that the capital that's employed to create things is so powerful and so overwhelming that it can produce way more than could ever be absorbed. But it comes to a point where they're simply not going to produce anymore, which means that the normal state of monopoly here is stagnation. So it means a huge portion of the capital that they've put up has to lay idle. But they still have to maintain a certain minimum of profitability, they can't really generate this, this surplus that simply can't be bought. And that's what we mean by deflation. There's too many items in the market and demand collapses. Again, that's what COVID did. So it's clearly not in the interests of, of monopoly capital to increase production beyond the point where it's simply not profitable. You talked about the crash of oil prices where it actually costs more money to store the oil than it is to sell them at that low, low level. So what we used to call a period of stagnation now is normal. The temporary crisis has become permanent. At the same time this is going on, of course, labor productivity continues to go up. It doesn't matter what else is going on, the way that workers, especially in, in the U.S., um, their ability to produce continues to get more and more efficient. That's quite independent of anything else. So you have increasing labor productivity um, without the demand and with overproduction. So when you have something like COVID that collapses demand, and it collapses demand relative to the production, uh, productive capacity of, of capital, the system as a whole, it leads to huge amounts of resources, capital and labor, laying idle. Um, Paul Maddock, 
um, who wrote his, um, I believe it was 1966 work on Monopoly, Monopoly Capital, which is where we are now, says this. The tendency to stagnation creates anomalous solutions such as wasteful advertising and other expenses. It includes destructive military spending and global corporate dominance of the culture. Under monopoly capitalism, billions of dollars are wasted on conspicuous consumption and fashion to reinforce social distinctions. Escalating managerial bonus, uh, bonuses heighten class distinctions and expand inequality. Monopoly capital enterprises promote the degradation of work through skill fragmentation into tiny compartments of minor skills. Workers are less master craftsmen and more appendages of the technical apparatus. That was written in 1966 and has become um, more pronounced since then. Now, what does a regime do when you have massive overproduction but demand falls off? It's the creation of credit. That's pretty much the only weapon they have at the moment. Now, that was the case in the 80s and 90s. Uh, in the 70s, a credit card first developed. Of course, credit's been around a long time, but consumer credit is another matter. But since 2008, even that's reached its, um, its uh, maximum. When you don't have higher wages, it just means increasing debt and the speculative bubbles, like the real estate bubble we had, that led to the Depression, like in 2008. These aren't recessions, these are depressions. So because of the growing skill of labor and their tremendous productivity, which is not reflected in their wages, by the way, these economic uh, surplus that's created can't be absorbed by consumer spending, doesn't matter how much credit they get. Uh, luxury spending can't do it, even government spending can't do it. It results in falling wages and higher wage le levels of both underemployment and unemployment. And on top of all that, profitability goes down, and the only thing that can happen is massive monopoly power among a, de a decreasing number of massive corporations. It's a simple economic law, and that's where we are now. That's what BlackRock and Vanguard represent. Remember, this isn't an aberration. This is capitalism. It's inherent to the revolutionary ideology of modern and postmodern capitalism. Capitalism operates through, at least at one point, not anymore, but at one point through a competitive market. And the way to win that, of course, is to cut costs to the bone and expand production. And in order to do that, you need constant capital accumulation and massive explosions in technology. And, and new methods of organization and everything else. Competition makes sense really only if companies can make commodities more cheaply than others, but also that depends on labor productivity and, and technology. Given COVID, that's really reached its, its limit. So BlackRock is the final manifestation of this phenomenon because only massive monopolies like them can maintain profitability, really regardless of external circumstances. So as of right now, they control where almost every penny of investment is going to go because they control credit. So the COVID crisis was created to sort of finalize and institutionalize monopoly. BlackRock appointed itself to be the administrator of all the financial ramifications of the of the crisis. They did the same thing after 2008. So in March of 2020, um, I, of course, talked about uh, after two days after the lockdown, the Fed announced a $2 trillion bailout of the massive corporations that um, it works with. But in March... I think it was just before the lockdown. It was given the, well, what, what amounts to a non-competitive contract under the CARES Act to put together uh, initially about a $500 billion fund established by the U.S. Treasury in partnership with the Federal Reserve. Now, of course, as a single unit because BlackRock controls both directly 
Now that 500 billion was then leveraged into about $4 trillion in Federal Reserve credit. So even if a corporation could put together, let's say, again, like $500 billion in actual money, that by itself doesn't say anything. That huge amount of money then could be parlayed into credit. You could borrow against that, and that's where the trillion figures come from. So $500 billion was leveraged into $4 trillion. As this is going on, as I predicted at the time, you will have race riots, you know, lockdowns and, and all kinds of protests that the regime created out of whole cloth. And just as it's hap- this is happening, finally, BlackRock comes out into public view as a blatant liberal dictatorship, sort of the Napoleon of the liberal revolution. When you dominate almost all the corporations of the Western, even the Eastern worlds, outside of state corporations, and beyond that, most of the world's central banks and the monetary policy. This is the apogee. This is power that Rothschilds couldn't dream of. This is now the next step above all of that. Now remember, Vanguard and BlackRock are essentially the same firm because they own each other's stock. So even the drug companies driving these COVID um, panic agendas are owned by the owned by the same people. Initially, of course, they simply controlled Time Warner, Comcast, Disney, News Corporation. Um, And, of course, they've leveraged way beyond that now. BlackRock and Vanguard together, it's almost impossible to conceive of the capital that they actually control. They have direct ownership in at least 1,600 of the largest American firms, just at a minimum. But, of course, no one really knows for sure. So again, the $50 trillion figure is probably correct, but given who they are, there's really no way to find out for certain. I mean, even Vanguard, it's really hard to tell who actually controls that. Their their ownership structure is very difficult to pin down. And the third, of course, is State Street. The three together, essentially one firm, control directly about 90% of the Standard & Poor 500 index. It should be noted that the uh, the name State Street, which comes from Boston, was initially called the Great Street into the Sea of the 18th century. It's a direct connection with the Venetian Republic and the marriage of the sea. The company's logo includes the old clipper ship, and it's meant, meant to reflect the maritime industry in Boston. And um, Essentially, you know, is the American version of the marriage of the sea ritual. So, going back to 2008, the Treasury invested roughly $2 billion in State Street as part of the Troubled Asset Relief Program. It now controls about $30 trillion, and it bought Goldman Sachs in 2012. It also bought GE's asset management branch in 2016. And it shouldn't surprise anybody to know that all three are devoted to the feminist movement. We'll see here in a minute that their investment strategy is only in leftist companies, and they'll strangle anyone who doesn't um, doesn't accept it. But with all this ridiculous levels of money, back in 2010, it cut employee wages by 10% and forced employees to work 10-hour days. Well, that's how they cut it, 10%, by by increasing their workday. All three of these, by their own um, memos, only invest money in so-called woke firms. I don't like using that language. And that means, and they say this directly, that left liberalism is now the official ideology of corporate capital. Uh, Fink um, wrote a lengthy article to the, you know, hundreds or thousands of corporations that he controls saying that you're going to have a diverse board and and you're going to support, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and everything else uh, financially. And if you don't, you're going to lose the credit that we, we control. So as it stands now, BlackRock, we know who controls it. Vanguard and State Street, 
are often difficult to to pin down. Um, but all the oldest, you know, blue blood families are connected to Vanguard funds. While um, BlackRock is entirely Jewish, Vanguard was founded by John Bogle, who was a Gentile. And you'll see a lot of Gentile names, and I think they're being promoted to not have every name uh, Jewish, which was Stalin's advice to the Hungarian People's Republic. To, because it was almost 100% Jewish in the 20s, um, he advised Bela Kuhn to find somebody who wasn't Jewish and make him president, which you know had no power. Lou Rockwell says this, The stock of the world's largest corporations are owned by the same institutional investors. They all own each other. It means that competing brands like Coke and Pepsi aren't really competitors, since their stock is owned by the same investment companies, investment funds, insurance companies, banks, and in some cases, governments. The smaller investors are owned by larger ones. Those are owned by even bigger investors. The visible top of this pyramid shows only two companies whose names we've seen. They are Vanguard and BlackRock. The power of these two companies are beyond your imagination. Not only do they own a large part of the stocks of nearly all big companies, but also the stocks of the invest investors in those companies. That is a complete monopoly. A Bloomberg report states that both of those companies in the year 2028 together will have investments in the amount of $20 trillion. That means they own almost everything. I don't remember when Rockwell wrote that, um, but um, it's far higher than $20 trillion and it will not be by 2028. It's far higher than that in 2021. The name Vanguard is significant, just like State Street is. It normally means, if the formal definition is the foremost position of an army uh, that advances into, into warfare, it could also mean the, the leading position in a, in a movement or a trend. But most of you know that Lenin called his party the Vanguard Movement. The Vanguard was the elite of the Bolshevik Party. The other source of the name is the HMS Vanguard, a ship that was used to do battle with Napoleon's army during the wars after the French Revolution, meaning they're both sides of the same coin, either British merchant capitalism or the Napoleonic uh, revolutionary merchant capital. So it's all essentially one movement leading to COVID and the Great Reset, of course, existed before COVID, which, as we all know, is a transfer of wealth and ownership from the oligarchy to the monopoly. COVID was necessary to be the catalyst to finally uh, end the oligarchy and make it, uh, in their minds, more stable as a monopoly. Vanguard is not publicly traded. And it seems that State Street is now pretty much a proxy and Vanguard and BlackRock own each other. So without question, they hold a monopoly in all the world's industries. And they, of course, are owned by the wealthiest families on the planet, though sometimes not directly, and that's very, very difficult to discern. So their control is total, but you're not going to hear a lot of mainstream economists even talking about them, as I've already mentioned. A few writers tried to claim that there was an attempt to regulate uh, the Vanguard funds through the Dodd-Frank law in 2010, as I mentioned, that they allegedly lobbied to be exempt from this. And, of course, that's wrong. They didn't lobby anyone. They don't have to lobby anyone. They simply gave the order. And, of course, the press is largely forbidden to talk about this. And even if they did, they didn't know what was happening anyway. BlackRock isn't a law to itself. It is the law. And it means that Larry Fink is probably the world's most powerful man. I used to define the regime as the corporate state combine. Now I really mean to the three major, I mean the three major asset management companies and the so-called um, ratings agencies. <clears throat> 
but they control them, those two. And I have spoken at length about how the ratings agencies um, are used to make war on countries that don't go along. I've listed those nations. Politically, it's very clear. Fink made the German CDU uh, member of parliament, Friedrich Merz, named him the head of BlackRock Germany when it looked like he was going to succeed Angela Merkel. So he was going to have board members as executives in, in the country. No, it didn't happen. But they did the same thing in, in Britain where the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, became the political consultant. When he was no longer Chancellor, he was brought on and made, made a member of the board. Fink then also named um, Hillary Clinton's Chief of Staff, Cheryl Mills, to the BlackRock board when it would seem that she was going to win in 2016. When someone leaves the board of the central bank, Fink will then name them to the board of one of his institutions. And that's how he secures these contracts with, with uh, central banks. It's all one and the same movement. So Stanley Fisher, who was the former head of the Bank of Israel, and then became later vice chairman of the Federal Reserve, is now one of the senior advisors to BlackRock. I mentioned Philip Hildebrand, former Swiss National Bank president, is now vice chairman at BlackRock. Or at the very least, uh, he oversees the BlackRock Investment Institute. The former deputy governor of the Bank of Canada, um, Jean Boivin, is a global head of research for the same company, the, the BlackRock Investment Institute. That's just the beginning. In other words, there's no separation of state, central bank, private bank, private corporation, industry, services, universities. It's all now a BlackRock Vanguard monopoly. Now, as far as this ridiculous so-called Biden administration, it looks even more obnoxious. Anyone who believes that this man could make decisions or can function at all is an absolute moron. And because BlackRock and Vanguard control major media, it's very hard to bring any real understanding to any of this. It's hard to bring this to light when all the modes of communication are tightly controlled. And this control is far more severe than, than the Communist Party control over Pravda. The difference is one is a formal state system. This one is far more indirect, but far more powerful. Having frontmen, like last week we talked about in, in Florence, um, how the Medici simply controlled not only the politicians in Florence, but also the Pope of Rome, at least two popes. Um, frontmen are extremely important. You put President Biden, you have to put that in quotes, but the man can't read a, a teleprompter. He can't answer even prepared questions from an equally prepared media. I mean, you've heard the, the confusing Syria and Libya, or even whether or not he's president. And of course, the White House is completely under their control. In 2019, um, Biden, again in quotes, was a long shot. He's very unpopular in his own party. He met Larry Fink in New York and then decreed that Biden would win and continued to pour on the vitriol thrown against Trump from the day he declared his candidacy. This president, again in quotes, named Brian Deasy, be the director of the National Economic Council, which of course is the main, uh, the central advisory body for economic policy. Deasy before that, engineered the auto bailouts under the Obama administration. And one of the earliest so-called executive orders um, had to do with economics and so-called climate policy, which is essential to BlackRock today. And DC comes from the uh, company's global, he's a global head of sustainable investing. And before he went to BlackRock, DC was um, senior advisor to Obama, as I mentioned. And, um, and he replaced John Podesta, senior advisor, um, 
to Obama at the time. And it was D.C. who played a, a, an important role in negotiating the global warming, so-called Paris Accords. Then um, Deputy uh, Treasury Secretary, uh, which, you know, under Janet Yellen, was a Nigerian named Adwala Adyemo, who I believe from 2017 to 19 was a senior advisor to Larry Fink directly. That was after he left the Obama administration. You have another one, Michael Pyle, who is the senior economic advisor to the ridiculous Kamala Harris. Prior to that, he was the global chief investment strategist at BlackRock. And of course, also worked for the Obama administration. And he was, I believe, the senior advisor to the Undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs, which is extremely important, that also became an advisor to Hillary Clinton in 2015. Unfortunately, at the end of 2016, Fink was brought on by uh, President-elect Donald Trump in his business forum um, as a strategist for basic economic policy. But I don't think that lasted very long. Uh, because Fink, um, while he did have a toehold in that administration, was very much irritated by Trump's independence in that regard. One of the worst, I mentioned this last week, is Tom Donilon, D-O-N-I-L-O-N. -O -O and again, he was Obama's former national security advisor and a key advisor to so-called Joe Biden, again in quotes, throughout his career, not just today. And the funny thing is that Donilla knows nothing about national security, but proves that the national security advisor really is nothing more than promoting the interests of, of finance. And Donilla has been, been in this for 35 years, defending monopoly capital. He was a registered lobbyist from uh, 2000 to 2005 for the law firm um, O'Melveny and Myers, which is a massive international business uh, law organization. And he only had one client, that was Fannie Mae. And he was executive vice president for law and policy at the same place. So you have Fannie Mae, and then of course this direct revolving door with um, the administration, and then BlackRock. But that doesn't end there. His brother, Mike, another senior advisor to Biden, and he deals with inter-administration policy. Mike uh, Danilo um, deals with spending, regulation, budget, and he's a senior advisor to the president. His wife, Catherine Russell, is the White House personnel director. That means she controls who gets hired and fired. And the worst and most obnoxious is Sarah, just graduated college in 2019, Who's on the White House National Security Council? She's a kid. She knows nothing about national security or pretty much anything else. But because of her connection to him, now sits on that National Security Council, believe it or not. And this is just the beginning. It means that the chairman of BlackRock, the chairman of the Investment Institute, he decides where the $10 trillion investment from where it goes from BlackRock, where the money goes, has a brother, the senior advisor to Joe Biden, a wife, the White House personal director, and a daughter, basically a child, now on the National Security Council. And I'm also convinced that they use explicitly Gentile names to hide the complete Jewish domination of these institutions. The three Jewish controllers who I mentioned, the three most powerful men in the world, are their bosses. And I think it's very important for them to use these various, um, obviously, Gentile names to make certain that it's simply not perceived as a Jewish ethnic movement. And really, I'm just getting started here. March 2019, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York hired BlackRock to manage its um, mortgage-backed securities program and to administer the $750 billion uh, purchases of corporate bonds and the ETFs 
and of course, non-competitive contract. But again, even using the word like hire doesn't make any sense, since certainly BlackRock is far more powerful than the Fed. In fact, it's hard to tell where one begins and the other ends. The 2019 Fed bailout, this is the first time since uh, bailouts happened, hired BlackRock directly with $750 billion. Um, the primary and secondary corporate bonds and bond ETFs, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And the ETF, or the exchange-traded funds, uh, really was created by BlackRock and Vanguard. Now, if that's not bad enough, this is a pro- the program BlackRock created, um, who controls about $100 billion of the $454 billion in taxpayer money, which takes the losses of, of corporate bond purchases, which includes its own ETFs, which the Fed was commanded then to sell. And it's hard to really grasp all this, not even because of the complexity of it and all the various institutions, but it's hard to wrap your brain around this level of power in one organization. Now, in the future, you may be hearing more about ETFs, exchange-traded funds. The nationalist movement is very weak in this area. The technical nature of these kind of investments are absolutely critical to understanding the economy. Think of the ETF as a mutual fund that functions um, uh, as an index fund. It's part of a stock exchange, so to speak. It's a mutual fund. In other words, it's a, it's a diverse group of everything from stocks, bonds, gold, whatever, commodities. And they're decided in real time rather than at the end of the day. They're index funds. So with index funds, no one's really, no one's behind the scenes um, deciding what investments are good or bad. It's a collective, not an individual decision. So no one's making bets on this stuff like you used to do. Not really doing anything. It's what we call passively managed funds. Um, securities are bought and sold um, basically just because they're part of the index, like the S&P 500. So index funds just mirror the market. They don't pick winners or losers like you think of when you when you buy and sell stocks, which comes down to the fact you have roughly 12 people in three companies who control where the world's investment money goes. In other words, it buys groups of assets only from massive companies meaning the smaller ones, including very innovative ones, are starved of credit. And that's the nature of a passive investment. Annie Lowry wrote uh, an article in The Atlantic, which is usually an execrable publication, but she kind of makes more sense out of it. She says this, Active managers direct investment dollars to companies on the basis of those companies' research and development prospects, human capital, regulatory outlook, and the rest. They take new information and price it into a company's stock when buying and selling shares. If company A's stock price tanks when it announces a major scandal, that's because active investors are selling. If company B's shares soar when it announces entering a new market, that's because active investors are buying. Passive investors, by contrast, ignore annual reports and market rumors. They do nothing with trading floor gossip. They make no attempt to research what to invest and what to skip. Whether holding international or domestic assets, holding stocks or bonds, using a mutual fund structure, an ETF, they just mirror the market. Big U.S. stock index funds buy big U.S. stocks just because they're big U.S. stocks. In other words, competition doesn't exist anymore. It hasn't existed in a long time. Markets, if they ever existed, are certainly now a thing of the past. The head of the Fed, Jerome Powell, of course, Larry Fink, are, are close friends. Because really, Powell is an employee of, of Fink. And believe it or not, Powell gave BlackRock a massive bailout deal. Powell was in order to have the same BlackRock manage an estimated $25 million in Powell's private investment. Again, all of this is illegal, but there's no way to enforce it. BlackRock does the enforcing. You can't enforce law on them. But that's just the beginning. 2019, Fink joined the board of the Davos World Economic Forum, one of those powerful institutions in, in um, the sea-based powers, the, the New World Order, so to speak. 
think is very close to Klaus Schwab. And now the Great Reset has BlackRock's force behind it. And part of the Great Reset is the so-called ESG, corporate investing. And with roughly $9 trillion directly under his control, he's channeling this money into ESG. In other words, any non-liberal company will be driven out of existence. ESG stands for Environment, Social Values, and Governance. They have to be politically leftist to get any money. So the very same banks that created the financial crisis in 2008 are creating yet another crisis using COVID as their, their cover story. So the Great Reset Agenda now steers trillions in investment to these so-called woke companies that are hand-picked. BlackRock uh, declared in 2018 that they're creating this new investment infrastructure where liberalism is the prime way that these passive investments are being chosen. Not even profitability, not even innovation. It's ideology. Now, despite being liberal companies, oil and coal companies are now in serious trouble. They won't have access to credit. And I'm telling you that energy is no longer a foreign policy concern of the U.S. because BlackRock is throwing a huge amount of money in so-called sustainable forms of energy. I would not maintain investments in the traditional energy sector. I'm not sure about gas, but oil and coal, I believe, are in trouble. They may do something about that. If you go to the major oil firm's uh, corporate governance website and their, where, their, where their tax-exempt foundation money goes, as always, it's all to leftist uh, firms. Uh, I'm sorry, leftist nonprofits and, and organizations. Every once in a while, you come across donations to the Heritage Foundation or Cato, which, who, of course, are you know basically liberal um, or libertarian groups. Even that's now coming to an end. Oil and coal are in serious trouble unless they're able to redouble their investment in liberal causes. They're traditionally seen as so-called conservative companies, and they're not, at least as far as their taxes and foundation money. They're going to have to increase that substantially if they want to stay in Fink's good graces. Let me give you another example. The Bank of Canada has a very strange governing structure. Uh, in March, just a few months ago, um, said that the BlackRock Financial Markets Advisory was brought on to quote-unquote advise on their monetary policy during the you know, the COVID crisis, which means advise. It means they now control the bank. And and that was just, well, I think in the same day that BlackRock was given the same role in um, the Federal Reserve. They are now controlling the $5 trillion corporate fund to bail out um, themselves, I guess, through the CARES Act. I mentioned before, as far as the collapsing demand, the stimulus packages, they're mostly going to corporate America and leftist organizations. But as far as ordinary, um, you know, small-scale investors or even ordinary citizens are concerned, the few dollars that filter down to them is a very weak attempt to try to maintain demand. You see, this is why state control over assets, especially in small countries, is absolutely essential. I'm not saying that for Western countries. You don't have a, a patriotic or nationalist force that could run a state industry. You do have it in Russia and China and, and Belarus and places like that. And often they're, they're military men who are put in control. They see that in Burma and in, in Russia in some cases. The war against Russia and China is about attempting to take down the state structure of the banks and many corporate entities. They helped create the idea of the public-private partnership, though even that's obsolete, because there is no public-private uh, distinction anymore, as I've said a thousand times in the past. So the war now is against large state enterprises, especially in the natural resources area and in the central banks, Russia and elsewhere, that list that I gave at the beginning of the, of the talk here. As it stands right now, 
the massive Eurasian market is out of the regime's control, at least direct control. This is what a lot of these sanctions are all about. Now, as far as Canada is concerned, the longer Canadian cities face this, these economically difficult times, they're going to be forced to privatize. BlackRock will make them an offer, as we say, that they can't refuse, simply on financial grounds. Then the EU hired BlackRock to advise them on new environmental rules for banking supervision um, across the continent. As I mentioned, the 2007-2008 crash and the massive Wall Street bailout um, is one of the places where Larry Fink really came to prominence, so-called advising governments and corporations how to deal with these um, toxic assets that we've spoken about many times in the past. So, I mean, I don't even know, I don't even know how to summarize this. I have no idea really what to do except to allow, like you had in the Soviet Union, the system to collapse under its own weight. You notice that with all of these things, nothing's actually being produced. This is asset stripping. In the last few minutes of this talk, I want to come up with a few points. I don't know if I could get through them all. Uh, about the implications and the operation of now monopoly capital, which has finally been achieved recently. Any kind of monopolistic organization absolutely controls labor and media and everything else. Now, there's been no struggle with labor in the U.S. for decades, and labor is paid far below its productivity rate. And given BlackRock's power at the moment, nothing's really going to change that. Using immigration and women in the workplace, they can split a labor organization very easily. That's number one. Number two, of course, voting is useless when you have one company controlling economic policy. In other words, politics doesn't exist anymore. Given that most people, including well-educated people, don't really know how these things operate, public debate is largely impossible, even if the press was in control. And the third point is that the state no longer exists. I mean, we're going to keep using the language because we don't, we don't have a full new vocabulary yet. But the state at this point is almost completely privatized when you have all of these advisory bodies deciding everything from fiscal policy to national security. Number four, I've been saying this for a long time, but now it's going to go into high gear. The left is going to completely forego economics entirely, completely. Their focus is exclusively on race and gender and, and sexuality. That will be the only topic for debate from here on in. Of course, debate is in quotes. Number five, there will be no anti-war movement in the future. Number six, you're going to see the neocons, the so-called conservatives, defending BlackRock. And they'll do it on the, ba on the foundation of anti-socialism or not to have state regulation of so-called markets, me meaning they're going to end up being completely incoherent. Number seven, posts in government are going to be appointed based on closest to the monopoly regime. It will have nothing to do with merit, of course, party patronage, or even basic policy. When you have this kid, Danilan's daughter, uh, on the National Security Council in the White House, the only way that people are going to be appointed to anything is based on their closeness to the monopoly. Number eight, public policy no longer really exists. Politics is really a corporate board meeting. And the membership of this corporate board is almost completely secret. Number nine, even law really don't, doesn't exist, at least not in the sense that we normally use the term. By definition, a monopoly of this size is not just above the law, but they create the law. Ten, even the concept of regulation doesn't exist in the normal sense of the term because monopolies actually do the regulating. You can't regulate a monopoly. There's no independent body that can then impose its will. And even if there was, no one has this kind of power. The monopoly creates the regulating body that so-called regulates it. Eleven, at the moment, not much can be done because of the extreme levels of immaturity 
amongst those who oppose the regime. And worse, few could even follow some of these arguments, because really they're too technical for, for the common run of voters. Media and academia are entirely under the monopoly control. I'm using the word regime now to refer to this monopoly. Number 12, more technically, when a monopoly sets prices, you then have a what's called a hierarchy of profit rates. So the highest levels of profit are in the most concentrated sectors, the lowest in whatever's left of the competitive sectors. So the distribution of the surplus has to now go to the larger units of capital. Smaller units of capital, to the extent that they're going to exist anymore at all, are going to have the lowest uh, levels of profit. And since profitability is, is, is now based on the passive investments, that means money and credit only goes to the largest firms anyway, regardless of, of any other factor. Number 13, credit, of course, is monopolized by these massive firms on the same grounds as the passive investment strategy. 14, um, prices have nothing to do with markets. These have been myths for a very long time. Anyway, markets haven't functioned for decades, if at all. Consumption is based on what the monopoly offers, offers, not what's in demand. Demand is created in mass advertising and fashion. I'm not saying that we can't, at a, at a low level, do what we can to distance ourselves from the regime, refusing to go along with these fashions. That's the minimum that we can do. Number 15, and this is iffy, I think, but a fairly small section of the white-collar um, workers that could be given substantial rewards to defend the system, obviously using race war to deliberately silence any opposition. But even with that, wages are still going to stagnate and fall because you don't have much competition among firms, and you, they could use mass immigration including in skilled labor. 16, the political positions that parties and groups are going to have are going to get closer and closer together to the point where you're essentially going to have a singular ideology. They'll use different words and different languages, all saying the same thing. So it's going to take a long time for people to notice that they're one and the same um, ideology. 17, innovation is going to start falling away because now there's no incentive. You have a basic monopoly. Um, the pa a passive investment idea won't really take a chance on innovation. They often come from small firms that are high risk. There's simply no incentive to create new products, unless, of course, it serves to another non-financial interest. 18, as I've said, services, the state, finance, industry, education, have merged almost entirely. Number 19, when you talk about the demand side of things, uh, a monopoly will adopt the policy. They'll slow down and carefully regulate the expansion of their capacity to maintain a rate of profit um, the highest they possibly can. So if deflation is going to be the norm when demand falls, monopoly can control for this by simply printing money and reducing its supply. Mass unemployment doesn't really matter. Because, you know, if there's a lot of unused capital, you're going to have mass unemployment. Um, it doesn't make any difference because media is in the hands of, mon of the monopoly. As I've said many times, the U.S. has been in, in a depression since at least 2008. But no one's noticed. Number 20, market entry is impossible. I don't, I don't really see how small business can function under monopoly power. You're always going to have rebel businesses that we need to support. But who could you possibly, how can anyone match the, the, um, the research, the development, the advertising of the massive um, uh, dominant firms? Not to mention, they've created the market in the first place. Number 21, you have the cost push inflation because prices aren't connected to value anymore. And 22, you know, the whole concept of, of monopoly can only be pure when it's the financial side of things. That's in, in control. 23, 
competition in the minds of these guys is inherently unstable, as Rockefeller used to say. Now, monopoly is stable in their minds, so long as no one can identify it. The only competition that may exist is through factions within the monopoly itself. But when you have ethnic, uh, a homogenous ethnic foundation, that could very much be controlled. But that's not 100% certain. 24, monopoly can produce what it wants at a very low cost because of economies of scale, of course. 25, power is now entirely behind the scenes, just like Florence or Venice. It's invisible to almost 99% of the population. 26, those nations that I've listed in opposition to the regime are going to see a more aggressive American military. And finally, this is going to be the last thing I say here. This is the most radical revolution in world history. It is a summation of all revolutions of the past. It's going to see a reorganization of life, as the Great Reset itself says, far beyond any other revolution in history. This is a summation. It's the synthesis of all previous revolutions in this Great Reset, if it goes the way that they, they claim. There are things that can be done. We have a lot of foreign opposition. We have huge countries, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and our own communities here at home. It can be done, but on a mass public level, I don't think that's happening for a while. Don't forget, the Soviet Union seemed like this huge behemoth right up until 1990, and it collapsed under its own weight. This is just beginning. These people are arrogant, and they believe that they're in full control, but they know that it's always dangerous, it's always a risk. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.